Hello and welcome to those who are joining us. Um, please come on in, welcome in. Um, my name is Solitaire, I'm the co-founder of Futera and I would love to know who we have here with us today. So as you come in, as you, as you register and enter, um, it would be fantastic if people wanted to go into the chat function and introduce themselves. Um, uh, if, you, if you set your introduction to panelists and attendees, then we can all see who's here. So I will start and I'll say, hi, Solly from Futera here, based in London. Um, and we'd just love to see who's joining us today. And I can see more and more people logging on. Um, we're just going to give it a couple more moments before we brought, before we start, because we know folks have got to put their email addresses in. Yeah, please do go into go into the chat function, uh, hit chat, and let us know who's joining us. It's great to see folks joining. Please remember to set it to panelists and attendees. As panelists, we really like to see who you are. But if you don't, if you set it to panelists and attendees, then everybody else can see who's here. So please do where it says two, please click the little button that says panelists and attendees. We can see lots of folks introducing themselves. Thank you. We're just going to give that another second just to make sure because we know you've got to put your email address in. So we want to make sure that everybody can get in. So click the button where it says two, that says panelists and attendees and let us know who's here. It's great to see so many people joining. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. So I think we've got quite a few folks um, on board now and we want to use the time really effectively. So we're going to get started. Um, my name is Solitaire Townsend. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Futella. And I'm so excited to be hosting this debate today on the food revolution, on the pandemic, on the people and on what's changing. Um, I've got a fantastic panel uh, today, which I know we're really eager to get to. And what I'd like to ask you to do is if you've got questions for a panel, for me or for anybody else on the panel, um, it would be really helpful if you use the Q&A function, because I think we're going to get a lot of debate and a lot of introductions happening in chat. And so if you could use the Q&A function, then that will mean that we can see the specific questions which are for any of the panellists. I'm just going to share my screen now and I'm going, to, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction to who we are and also to this incredible piece of research that we're going to be sharing um, with you today and which will be available to everybody at the end of the webinar. Um, so we've got myself, Solitaire, um, I'm co-founder of Futella. Many of you We'll know Futera, we'll have heard about this few, few, through Futera. Futera is a change agency, and we work both on the logic of sustainability with companies such as Danone and also Google and even Formula One on setting big sustainability targets and goals. And we also work on the magic, on telling the stories of sustainability through marketing and messaging. Uh, we're also a food company. We've just launched a, uh, a insect-based a cat food brand. So we're now actually in the food system ourselves. Um, we always like to, to base our work on true insight and research and on evidence base. And that's why I'm so excited to share the um, Food Revolution Barometer with you. We've got Ethan, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at How Good. And again, we I would really recommend that you follow all these people. Um, uh, we've provided the, the, the details below. We have Leah, who is the co-director at Soul Fire Farm and the author of Farming While well Back. And we've got Nagar, who is the chief growth officer at Danon. We're here today to talk about uh, the food revolution, what is happening in our global food system and the contribution that um, Futera and the social listening experts at Bloom, all supported and powered by, um, by Danon, the contribution that we're making to this today is launching the Food Revolution Barometer. Now, what is the Food Revolution Barometer? Well, over the past several years, since 2018, 
Bloom, who have this incredible algorithm technology, have been listening to conversations about food on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter and Facebook, all, all in English. They've been listening to the English language conversation around food. What are we, all of us, as individuals, as citizens, as consumers, um, as eaters, what are we talking about um, when it comes to food? Now, we decided to start this social listening in 2018, and we were, we were just astonished in 2018 to find that there was 30 million conversations about food that were happening, that were ongoing. Then going into 2019, we decided to check if there was trends, and we saw this increase in the number of conversations um, uh, in, in, in 2019 and 2020, which went up to 33 um, million. And that's the point where we started to think about publishing some of the results. And then, of course, this extraordinary, terrifying pandemic hit. And we decided to continue listening because, of course, when the world changes, our food system changes. By autumn 2020, we listened to 55 million conversations by food. And this year, going into spring 2021, 107 million conversations about food. The conversations about food during the pandemic about the food system, about food and drink have absolutely exploded. Um, uh, and, and, and it's been incredibly humbling to be part of, of, of that and to be able to listen to those conversations. Each of these slides that I'm showing you are actually pages from the Food Revolution Barometer, um, which you'll have access to at the end of this webinar. Obviously, 103 million conversations is a lot. So we've broken them down into these 14, should we say, sort of trends, these, these 14 shifts that we're, um, that we're seeing in the food revolution, which can be, be, be um, categorised under how our food is made, the, what food we eat and the role that each of us as individuals play. Um, and each of these, um, each of these shifts, each of these trends, um, uh, we go into a deep dive on in the report. But I just thought I'd share with you an insight about what changed between October, November 2019 and then going into March and April 2021. Number one, the number of conversations about food online have exploded. Number two, all of these trends have increased. So number one, it's really important. All of these conversations have increased, but some of them have increased at a greater speed than others. So in October, November 2019, over, over several periods of listening, there was some stability. Issues around the planetary diet, particularly around climate change, are absolutely top of mind for people. Naturalness around food, food is me medicine. These were, these were really key, um, key and stable conversations. At the beginning of the pandemic, we thought that thought saw things shift quite significantly. But actually now where we are in April 2021, I think we're seeing a new emerging and stable trend, which is, can you see the increase there for people behind our food? The, the, the connection to the social food chain, to the humans, the people who make our food, um, be that in farms, be that in supply chains, be that in factories, be that in delivery um, folks, be that in supermarket workers, um, has absolutely stormed up, as has a sense of new activism around that. Obviously, issues around food as medicine, issues around how food can influence our immune system have grown. But I think it's really interesting that perhaps we might have expected the, the self-focus of food as medicine, as food for my immune system or as access to food for me as an individual to be priority. But it's that social solidarity with the people who, behind, who are behind our food, which people are, about, are talking about more than anything. So let's just briefly take a look at what you'll see inside the food barometer around each of these themes. So first of all, in the barometer, we take a look at the past. We take a look at what was happening before the pandemic in 2018 going into 2019? What was rising and falling? Because, of course, remember, we, we were tracking this for some time before the pandemic. And, and on this issue of people behind the food, there's a great deal of concern about farmers being exploited, victims of poor politics. Of course, because we're listening in English, there's, there's a, a significant um, contribution within this listening from India and elsewhere. 
funding and investments are necessary for farmers, but are funds really reaching farmers? This was a hugely engaged topic in 2019. Then the pivot. We take a deep look at, I'm not expecting you to read everything on this side. Um, this is just showing you what you'll find in the report. We see the pivot suddenly during the pandemic, you get this absolute explosion of conversations around standing in solidarity with farmers, whoever they are and wherever they're from, and real fighting the unfairness of food workers' wages. This issue becomes really personal, it becomes individual, it becomes a sense of connection for people with, with um, who made their food. Now this is really important and I hope that everyone gets a chance to dig into the data. But as well as looking at pivot at the pandemic, it's really important for us to actually look at what are some of the experts, what are some of the researchers and the academics and the, the, the thought leaders on this topic saying what might happen next? Because we get a choice. As we all know, the pandemic has changed a lot and it gives us the opportunity to change more. Um, and so for each of these themes, for each of these different th themes, um, we've analysed some of the suggestions of where we should go next. Now, that's not to say this is where the conversation is going to go next, but it might be where the action goes next. So from smallholder farmers being treated like cl the climate heroes that they are and can be, to ensuring adequate pay and protections for essential workers throughout our whole food chain. And we look at this, for example, the similar cadence of looking at the past, particularly um, in 2019, before the pandemic, this real interest in eating no meat or less meat for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and not shaming vegans for their choices. To then during the pivot, this is the theme on planetary diet, um, where suddenly we're not talking about to do plant-based or not to do plant-based, the conversation starts becoming how to do plant-based right. Processed food should be avoided in a vegan pro um, uh, lifestyle. And again, this, this social solidarity that plant-based alternatives to protect the planet should be democratized, that, of, that everybody should have access to them. Um, but also uh, the conversation went a lot from should we or shouldn't we go plant based to a lot of people asking for advice. <laughs> How do I? It's difficult. How do I do it? What do I eat? Uh, where do I go? Um, so you start to get you, you see on that um, uh, you see the score around engagement starting to go up on some of this, where people are actually asking and answering each other questions rather than just sort of broadcasting their opinion. So we begin to see these, these issues and um, these issues change. And then again, for the planetary diet in the report, we look again at what's the possible, what could we go forward with from new food economies being shaped by planetary boundaries to the true cost of food being widely understood. Now, I wanted to give that little, uh, that little advert for the food barometer, which is going to be available to everybody um, at the end of this webinar, because this kind of, kind of insight um, we hope will help everybody in making their choices, be you uh, 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 a business, be you a student, be you an entrepreneur, be you a farmer, or, or be you somebody who eats. <laughs> Cooks and eats. We hope that that these kind of insights help all of us make better food choices. And I, this has been a, a really significant undertaking for Futera and also for our amazing partners at Bloom, the social listening agency. And I just wanted to thank and give credit to uh, Danon for having uh, sponsored and powered this and also having been so open to actually open source this and make this available to everybody because this this is precious insight that Danon could have could have happily used themselves and actually they've they've decided to make this available to everybody working in the food system to help us make better choices so i wanted to give that as a setup around people and the pandemic and how the food system is changing to set up our debate and I'm going to come uh, uh, and go to you first to so Dan on huge food company working all around the world and to ask you to talk a little bit around what the food revolution means to you and how you see these shifts affecting your business. Thank you, Solite. First of all, let me say how excited I am to be joining today's conversation and about the reveal, the public reveal of the food barometer. Uh, why I'm excited? Well, on a personal level, I consider myself foodie. 
And I come, I am, I was born in Azerbaijan and in Azerbaijan, in our culture, food is not just central. It's like the largest part uh, of the identity and uh, expression of love and making families come together. But also I'm very excited as a chief growth officer, uh, growth officer of Danone. I am excited that uh, we as a company are sponsoring such an unprecedented in its depth and the scope the study going over the more than three years and so depth I went through the deck and I spent my Sunday afternoon and I really enjoyed it because the depth of the insights but also most importantly of the foresights is just very difficult to overestimate so why Danone uh, decided to sponsor and share I believe it's only natural for us to do it because first of all we as a company we believe that most important mission for us as a company is to bring health through food to as many people as possible. This is our mission and this is the reason why we uh, come to work every day and our frame of action, which is calling out that there is a intrinsic um, um, connection between the health of the planet and the health of people and the center point is the food. The choice which we are making in the, uh, what we drink and eat daily impacts the health of ours, the health of our economies, the health of our communities and the health of our planet. This is our frame for action. The second reason why uh, we wanted to go for the social listening uh, is because as a company, we are a global food company, but we pride ourselves for having be, for being multi-local company. We pride ourselves for being truly people-powered company. And what is the best way of um, learning uh, and doing what's right than just listening to people and truly listening and absorbing and acting on the insights and foresights which we are getting there? And finally, the third element why uh, it was almost no brainer for Danone to be sponsoring this study is because as a company, we love to share. We believe in the, um, in the power of collective actions. We stand and we are driven and we are passionate about making real impact, real impact on the health of people and on the health of planet. At the same time, we are under no illusion that our brands, even though they're lead brands in their categories, account for only a small share of what people eat and drink daily. So therefore, only joining forces, joining forces with all the players in the ecosystem, we can make a real impact. We can make things better, better for people, better for communities, better uh, for our planet. Hence, uh, the food revolution, we all are members of the food revolution. The moment we make a choice of the water or um, you know, what are we going to cook for dinner, this moment is we are participating in a food revolution. And therefore it's a uh, power of uh, everyone of us. And it's great to have the partners in this conversation today and to share the insights. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, and that that point around every time we choose to drink or choose to eat or choose to cook, we're making a decision about the world we want, I think is is such a core cool part of, of how Dan approaches things. And also every time you say that, it makes me hungry as well. So, um, I'm going to come next to Leah and to the work that Leah's doing with um, at Soul Fire Farm, which, by the way, if you don't follow them on Instagram, I would because it just makes me really happy every day to see what they post um, and some of this some of this you know working with farmers working um, at software farm some of this growing interest and growing connection that people online are talking about to where their food comes from are you seeing this is this is this a surprise to you or is this something which you're which you're experiencing in your work the short answer is yes. Uh, greetings, everyone. Leah Preneman, all pronouns, one of the founding co-directors and the farm manager at Soul Fire Farm. And in addition to Farming While Black, Farming While Black, working on a new book called Black Earth Wisdom. And just by way of a little bit of context, uh, we operate an 80-acre Afro-Indigenous regenerative farm 
in the indigenous Mohican territory, also called Grafton, New York, about four hours north of New York City. And we have the radical and ambitious mission to uproot racism and seed sovereignty in the food system. We're a small and mighty team of 10 that reaches over 70,000 participants every year in our programs. And those programs include growing food and medicine in a way that heals the soil and biodiversity, and then distributing that at no cost to people who need it in our community, right to their doorstep. We also run training programs for the next generation of black and brown growers, youth elders, urban rural, a fellowship program that helps people for the first 18 months of their new farm. Um, and then finally are involved regionally, nationally, and internationally to shift the really unfair policies that make it almost impossible to be a producer um, and survive um, and have the earth survive at the same time. So that's what we're all about. And to me, this work is not just in the material realm. You know, I think every day about my grandma's grandma's grandma, Susie Boyd, who was one of the women from the Dahomey region of West Africa who had the audacious courage to braid seeds into her hair before being forced to board a transatlantic slave ship. The millet, the rice, the cowpea, the agusi melon, the sesame, these seeds that we in, enjoy um, as a major part of our diet came smuggled with uh, people in the bowels of slave ships. And when I think about that type of hope in the face of really overwhelming conditions, it's impossible to give up. So pandemic in many ways deepened what we were already doing, right? There was the way that, you know, I've been farming over 25 years and working for racial justice almost as long as that. And the world sort of shifted and looked our way and said, oh, we really need food. We really need farms. We really need social justice. Um, you know, I'm being, I'm oversimplifying, but I'll mention a few, a few things that we noticed from the producer vantage point. Um, one, as, as you already alluded to in this beautiful report, is this upsurge of interest in being really intimate with our food. People wanted to grow their own food, understand where food comes from. Our phones and emails and uh, instant messages were just exploding with, you know, how far apart do you plant carrots? And what if I want to save a tomato seed? And if I only live in an apartment and I have a windowsill that's east facing, what can I grow? Um, so we ramped up um, and expanded a lot of our courses so that we could, um, you know, have offerings online like the monthly Ask a Sister Farmer show and a series of webinars and how-to videos. So that was huge. Uh, we build urban gardens for families who are survivors of hunger. And in the past, we'd done a handful of gardens every year. And then we had dozens of people lining up just in our small, you know, we're in a very small community wanting to grow their own food and talking about not just uh, the power of, of being able to do something when the grocery store shelves are empty, but also the power of connecting their children to nature, connecting their children to their own food source. So that, that was a huge trend. Um, another is seeing producers deepen their commitment to being connected to mutual aid and emergency food and solidarity networks. Um, and uh, there was a whole coalition of farmers that were really pushing the USDA to make sure that some of these COVID relief funds worked for producers to be able to get food to those who need it. You know, the initial iterations of those box programs um, didn't work for small scale producers. And so there were many changes that came into place so that farmers could, you know, be paid for what they were producing, but then it would go to people experiencing hunger, usually through a mutual aid or an emergency food network. Um, and that's become more commonplace where farmers are thinking about set asides for emergency food as part of their business planning. Um, and then as you, I, I love how you call it social solidarity, but certainly there was a heightened interest and maybe appetite for or tolerance at, um, at best to racial equity in the food system. So for those who don't know, our food system is hugely inequitable in many ways, including racially uh, in the United States. Farming, being a farm manager or owner is among the whitest professions. Being a farm uh, worker is among the brownest, meaning the most people of color are doing that profession. Uh, the food sector, people working in the food sector experience hunger at greater rates than other sectors. Uh, land ownership is hugely skewed in the United States where agricultural land is almost entirely white owned, 98% of the land value. 
um, hunger, diabetes, heart disease disproportionately Im um, impact communities of color. So huge disparities. And the pandemic exacerbated these disparities. We saw more hunger in communities of color. We saw farm worker exposure to COVID. Uh, we saw land loss from foreclosure in black communities, but also um, acts of solidarity. You know, people got really excited to support policy initiatives, to sign petitions, to do what they can. And then the last thing I'll mention in terms of a pivot, um, again, you alluded to this, but really people seeing that so many of these issues we care about really intersect the climate, food, racial justice, social welfare, um, and, and this almost poetic and tragic at the same time through line of our breath, you know, COVID attacking our lungs, the wildfires in California choking our breath, um, the I can't breathe as the last words of African Americans being murdered by, by police, and so um, the suicides in India taking away breath. And so this sort of rallying around the collective yearning that we all deserve to breathe and seeing that uh, regenerative farmers are among the climate heroes um, who can help with an aspect of that, but that's not isolated from these other issues. So um, all that to say, it's been a really, really busy year. <laughs> Our team is tired, uh, but we're motivated and thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I kind of welled up about twice then, which um, probably isn't terribly professional for someone who's moderating a panel, but that's really, really powerful insight in terms of what you're doing. Thank you so much. And I can already see folks putting um, some questions in the Q&A box. We are asking you to put questions in the Q&A box so it doesn't get lost in all of the chat that's going on. Um, if you've got questions for Leah, please do put them there. So um, Ethan, I'd love to hear from you around, from the insight that you have from the How Good team, like how is the food system changing in the pandemic and what do you see next coming in the future? Thanks, Talantair. Um, <clears throat> I'll do a little introduction to myself and then How Good and then also speak a bit about what the pandemic did and, and where we're going in the future. So uh, I'm Ethan Solovev, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at How Good. Um, I'm also a farmer on a small scale heading towards regenerative. I'm not sure we're quite there yet, but I manage a 30 acre apple orchard, uh, rotational sheep grazing farm, shiitake mushroom operation, also in the Hudson River Valley of New York. Um, I'm very much there every day, keeping my hands dirty while managing this massive database that Howgood has built. So Howgood has the world's largest product and ingredient sustainability database. Uh, we have over 33,000 ingredients that we track across 247 different sustainability metrics and attributes, and we've used them to assess over 2 million products in the food system. We also work with some of the world's largest food companies, Danone in particular, uh, many others that I can't name, but we're seeing this massive shift that is actually represented right here today in hearing from Nidyar, hearing amazing words from Leah. Uh, there's something that's happening that I think the pandemic has kicked up, which is not going to change in any time soon. So there's three main things that I see have happened uh, from the pandemic. The first is that it has irreversibly reconnected people all over the world to their food being in their home, you know, cooking. We saw some, some other social listening work that said there was a spike in things like, how do I cook broccoli? Or how do I hard boil an egg? Um, and just some really amazing basic stuff that people were just connecting to, the, to food, but then also to real food. They had to get it more directly. They had to prepare it themselves. There was this question, there was this global awareness in a way there hasn't been in quite some time of who's being impacted. Where did this come from? How does that connect to me? That is here to stay. We will not see that go away anytime soon. One of the other things that happened from the pandemic uh, is that we're seeing like uh, what I would call a barbell effect where there's both the strong move towards tiny, super regenerative, super organic, uh, you know, small farms uh, led by people of the global majority, led by people all over the place and just solidarity with that and sort of an upswing in awareness of that while at the same time, the major global food companies of the world, from Danone to General Mills to you know, many, many companies also sort of reconsolidated and it did great. Stocks did pretty well during the pandemic. People went back to comfort foods that they were used to. And so there's this interesting dynamic and at the same time, large scale agriculture that in some cases supports some of those companies also grew and is doing quing well. So we're seeing this split to the very tiny, the very regenerative and 
uh, the very large scale. And then the, the last thing that we saw as a, as a major trend from the pandemic is that we broke supply chains, but not enough from my perspective. And the reason I wanna say that is because I don't actually think supply chains exist in the world. We call them supply chains because unfortunately, we used to put people in chains to grow the food that many of us eat. And so the concept of a supply chain still has us chained to an older colonial extractive way of thinking about the world. And so I want that concept of a chain to be broken to see that it's actually an interconnected network and system of producers around the world that could be worked with in a more harmonious way, much like uh, Danone and others are starting to do of really connecting back to their farmers, back to their supply systems and saying, how can I uplift? How can I regenerate? And how can I build business strategy around that? Um, so these three things of reconnecting to real food irreversibly, this barbell from the tiny to the massive, and then supply chains broke and broke down, uh, but not enough conception. I think we need to go farther if we're going to be able to actually create a, a regenerative food system for the future. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So this is this has already raised a lot of questions about how do we bring justice into our food chain? Um, about how do we connect people to their food and of course um, as you said there's the, the difference between the the, the barbell the, the slightly perhaps um, unequal <laughs> of these huge numbers of small food entrepreneurs putting myself in at one at one end and then these large business we're getting a lot of great questions coming in um, and what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to start passing these out between people and also um, uh, really encourage folks to uh, to get involved and get more questions um, asked in the Q and A. So um, we've had what we've had one question, which is um, from Simona, which is overall um, around regenerative agriculture and how to make regenerative agriculture the norm, and also make sure that this idea of regenerative agriculture is equitable and accessible to all. We've got lots of big companies, Walmart's committed to it, um, uh, committing to regenerative agriculture. Um, folks may disagree on what that term means as well so i can see i can see leah's eyebrows raised and nodding so i'll come to leah first on this from a farmer perspective what does regenerative agriculture means too and i'd also love to hear from uh, Nigar at the other end at, at, a, at, a, at a manufacturer in terms of how you're working with the supply chain on that and then ethan i'm gonna um uh, uh i'm gonna come to you to ask some questions about the innovation about how we're seeing innovation. I think we've had a couple of questions in here from Juliana and um, and from others around what you know. You're, you're talking about these these supply chains being broken and that, that we need to change them. Like, do we have any great examples of innovation? So, Leah, first, regenerative agriculture. Good idea, bad idea. Who knows what it means? <laughs> I put my eyebrows up because there's a lot of debate about what it means. But I think it's important to start with origins and. I want to bring into the room um, ancestor Booker T. Watley, black farmer at Tuskegee University, who came up with pretty much everything that we, we categorize as farm to table. Um, and then going back even further to Dr. George Washington Carver at Tuskegee University, who came up with pretty much everything we classify as regenerative. And he was building on indigenous frameworks and indigenous technologies, but bringing them into the university setting and into the um, the field of modern agriculture. So um, Dr. Carver, an incredible person, could do a whole lecture just on him, but some of the examples of the type of techniques that he was bringing into popularity in the late 1800s and early 1900s included uh, cover cropping. That's when you plant a plant just to feed the soil. You're not actually harvesting it to eat. Um, especially important to him were uh, plants in the legume family, like peas and beans, because they collaborate with a soil bacteria to pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. Um, all plants pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. So um, carbon drawdown and cover cropping have a close relationship. Also talking about minimal disturbance of the soil. So no till, or if you are going to plow, plowing on contour, so you're not washing your soil away. Um, a little known fact is that within just one generation of European colonization of a landscape, you know, an average of 50% of the organic matter in the soil is destroyed. 
and that is a major contributor to anthropogenic climate change. So practices that keep carbon in the soil as organic matter include no-till, mulching, cover cropping, mulches when you put down uh, dead organic matter, um, semi-permanent raised beds, and then as Ethan was alluding to, uh, using perennials. Perennial plants are the ones that get woody stems and come back year after year, so trees and bushes being uh, the center of the system uh, or integrated into the system. And, you know, my eyebrow sort of stays up because I think that <laughs> what happened with, with organic could happen to regenerative really easily. You know, I was part of back in the 90s, there was a fight for the states to keep the organic label because we wanted to keep the integrity of of the nuance of it. We grow in soil, not in water. We um, make sure that animals actually see the sky and live natural lives, not just what we pump into their bodies. And, you know, when the federal government took over organic, it's become diluted over time. And, and I am wary to a regenerative and uh, becoming diluted in that way. I think it's so important that we center the indigenous peoples whose expertise created this technology. And the last thing I'll say, just because I anticipate a, a question about that is, well, you know, can re small scale regenerative really feed the world? It is still true uh, that the majority of the calories we consume are, gro are grown by smallholder farms. And it's also true that when you measure yields of conventional agriculture over just one season, they do beat organic and regenerative, yes. But as soon as you stretch out to four or five seasons and you allow for the opportunity for chaotic, unpredictable events like pest outbreaks, floods, hurricanes, droughts, all things which will become increasingly normal in a time of climate chaos, organic and regenerative meet or beat conventional because they're resilient systems. And so it's, it's important to understand that we have to be thinking in generational returns and not quarterly returns if we want to survive as a species. That was like a masterclass of regenerative. Thank you. Yeah. I've been working in this sector for years and that was so quickly put as opposed to the big the big books we read. Thank you so much for that. Now, I'm going to ask you to jump off this because um, and, and, and to respond to what Leah's just said, because Damien's also asked a question about um, you know, how do we stop this idea of regenerative agriculture being being watered down or becoming greenwash or, or the most popular term? Um, is, there a, is there a way that the that plays in the big food industry can help prevent that happening. Yes, absolutely. First of all, Leah, thank you so much. I've never heard such a clear and great explanation of the um, regenerative agriculture. And uh, I wish everyone could have uh, listened to you, all the consumers. And uh, But unfortunately, obviously, it's not possible to reach millions and millions of consumers through the webinar, even if it's the most exciting webinar. The way we reach to the millions and billions of consumers is uh, through the brands, through the food which is sold on the, uh, uh, in the supermarkets, in the uh, open markets, you know, the food which people buy every day. And the role of the big companies is uh, to educate, to educate through the brands and to support, to support the farmers which are sticking to the practices of the regenerative agriculture, of, uh, of um, being ethical in the way the crop uh, um, is uh, harvested and uh, the way the people are paid. Because you've talked a lot about the soil, what about the people and what about the labor um, uh, rights of people which are harvesting? You know, it's not a secret that uh, we do still uh, we still face the huge challenge of the modern slavery. So as a big company, taking commitments and acting upon those commitments of not um, allowing in our entire supply chain, and sorry, Ethan, I'm using this supply chain uh, word because I don't know what to, uh, how to replace it with a better. It. Yes, uh, making sure that uh, we give them, uh, we promote, and we support people and farmers and um, all, all the uh, players in the uh, chain which are sticking to the right um, practices. And then we also have to keep in mind that quite often it's more expensive. It's more expensive to grow organic. It's more expensive to stick to the, um, the practices of the regenerative agriculture. And uh, obviously, as uh, companies we and uh, as a farmers, we all need also to make profits. And I'm not talking about the super profits, but having profits to fuel the business, it's very, very important. Which then means that we need to educate our consumers 
re own the reasons and give them a good trust that when they are paying a bit of extra, they're actually buying the product which gives them the radical transparency of the, uh, the, the entire supply chain and the radical transparency of how the products were uh, produced and what ingredients are inside of it. It's actually easier to do it with the ingredients and it's easier for the food manufacturers to talk about the nutritional uh, values of the product. It's regulated very well, or, um, the labeling and the, all European countries now are following the Nutri-Score labeling, you know, and we are proud that we have 90% of our portfolio in the A and B Nutri-Score rated, but it's much more difficult to give this radical transparency on the provenance on where the food is coming from, who was participating in growing the ingredients, in harvesting, in putting it into the processing of it. And uh, this is where the collaboration with How Good is giving us hope that we will be able to bring this radical transparency. We will be able uh, to build this trust uh, for the company and trust between the uh, company's producers and all of us consumers of the food and raise the awareness that uh, yes, while paying a little bit extra, you are actually helping. You are helping your communities, you are helping uh, society and you are helping your planet. So for sure, it's a big role which big companies can play. And I'm excited to be um, in the non partnering with uh, big players and the small players as well. <laughs> Both ends of the dongle. So even Thinking about that dynamic, and particularly Leah talked about indigenous knowledge, and then we're also talking here um, uh, at a Danon level around, around this massive scale and this huge transformation that we've got coming. Um, what's the role of innovation? And actually, you know, and how, how do we how do we put those things together in a way that is productive? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to try to link all the, the threads together here. So I think the labeling that we're seeing in nutrition that's happening more and more in Europe, we're going to see that on sustain, environmental and social sustainability really soon. I see the next 12 to 18 months, there's going to be carbon labels of kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram on huge number of products on the large scale, on the small scale throughout the marketplace. In terms of innovation, one of the key aspects of regenerative agriculture from my perspective, uh, and then also I'll try to take it up to regenerative business at another level, but one of the key aspects of regenerative agriculture is that indigenous origins of it in each place that it comes from. So the future of food looks like a decentralized, super diverse, agriculture that is in deep reciprocity with the place and its own history, whether in the US, if that's Native American agroforestry systems, if it's the Sami reindeer herders, if it's the Mayan forest gardeners, there are unique indigenous roots of truly deeply regenerative agriculture in each place in the world. And companies will more and more get hip to that and figure out how do I make a product that is truly of this place that's with this special plant-based high protein, high fat nut that comes from here uh, and, and actually you know, produce in that way. So I think the innovation work is to figure out um, not just what are the practices of regenerative agriculture, because I actually don't believe that regenerative agriculture practices exist on their own because it's so context specific. I think that regeneration is really judged by what are the outcomes? Is there actually more carbon going into the soil? Are farmers actually being paid uh, living and beyond a living wage? If we can focus on the outcomes and a little less on exactly which way to go, this is one of the challenges with organic, uh, it was very practice-based and didn't have a, a way to focus on the outcomes. So if in agriculture, if we can focus on outcomes, but then in business also, if we can not just say, I'm a regenerative business now because um, I'm buying from regenerative agriculture, that's not enough. You actually have to figure out how do we transform inside the company? How do we understand what are the outcomes that would really make us a regenerative business? Then if those are clear and transparent, uh, it's gonna be a lot harder to greenwash because you're tracking against actual outcomes and not just sort of what you say or what you thought or even what you thought three or four years ago, this is changing very quickly uh, and companies have got to innovate if they're going to keep up with what's happening. Oh, it says, right, 
We've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to do some quick fire rounds. Um, uh, Leah, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to want, there's a really important question, which I'm going to want to from an anonymous attendee about what advice you have for a black woman who wants to start farming in their communities. And then I'm also going to ask you about your thoughts on biotechnology for agriculture and the impact on BIPOC communities. So I'm going to ask you both of those. Then, Nigar, I'm going to come and ask you about gender. We've had a really great question about gender, both gender in the food, food supply ecosystem, and I'm being careful with my words, but also in the fact that so much of the domestic work and the food choices are made by women all around the world um, in terms of um, in terms of uh, what we how we eat and when we eat and um, and what role we can see for gender um, at conversations. This. And then, Ethan, I'm going to work out what I'm going to ask you because we've got a lot of questions for you. So I'm going to start with, uh, we're going to start with Leah first. First, um, to honour the question about what advice do you have for black women who want to start farming in their communities? And then I'll come to the biotechnology question next. Sounds great, yes. Um, and I'll keep it quick because I know we only have a few minutes, but I want to say to the person who asked that question, uh, I've got your back, we've got your back if you're interested in getting into farming. And depending where you are, there are different resources that may be available. You're certainly welcome to reach out to us uh, through our website and email and we can hook you up. Uh, but usually the best place to start is by finding a mentor who will either coach you as you scale up from your garden to your market farm, smaller market farm, um, or to join a, a training program or apprenticeship. So we, we keep a list on our website of some of those that are available, but if you're not finding um, anything, do reach out to us. Uh, but learning is, is the first place, just like we wouldn't, you know, walk into a hospital, put on a surgeon's gown and, and just start cutting away. <laughs> you got to, with farming too, it really is, it's skilled labor. Um, and then as far as biotech, um, I think that, I, my belief is that as a, as a society, we're actually under investing in traditional plant breeding and in local communities capacity to save seed and to select varieties that are adapted to our microclimate. And so I'm not saying that there's no place for biotech, but I think that we are doing ourselves a great disservice as a species by not investing um, in traditional plant breeding and artificial selection, which is what led to all the foods that keep us alive today. Um, and, and that's really important. And also to Ethan's point can be democratized and decentralized and localized. Um, we need to make sure that all of our farmers and producers are skilled up and, and have capacity to generate new locally adapted varieties that are more productive, that are insect resistant, climate resilient, et cetera. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll pass it on from there. Brilliant. So I think we've had a very um, well thought through question, actually, from uh, Lucia around the role, role of women throughout the entire food supply chain um, and also the role of women as change makers of food. But also very smartly, she's also added how by focusing on the role of women as as um, change agents in food, will we actually increase gender equality by assuming that it's it's women who take those roles so it's quite a complex question um but i know that danon has thought a lot about the role of women in in food in the food system both in terms of making and also choosing and consuming food uh, i agree i agree that uh, women rule the world especially when it comes to food because most families uh, in most families it's mothers which are making the choice of the food and it's mothers which are teaching children what's good and what's the best way to take care of them. So obviously we are big decision makers. In Danone, there is a special program uh, to ensure that we have a gender equality within our company, but we also do a lot of effort to support the uh, female led farmers and uh, female led startups and uh, companies. And uh, I just, uh, wish that more people and more women uh, reach out to there and get into the farming because it's uh, it's tough job of course it's it's tough job but uh, i think we deserve to have our uh, fair share of um, uh, of um, contribution into the total supply chain for sure Brilliant. Thank you. So, Evan, we've had several questions around building more on this regenerative um, agriculture. But a question from Damien about should we be thinking about regenerative business, which we'd love to have, hear your views on. Um, and also, um, uh, Dr. Christopher has asked quite a specific question about carbon sequestration. Um, in order to be able to actually understand how carbon sequestration um, with all of the variables calculated within, which of course is a huge question um, in agriculture, which you can tackle if you want. 
but I'd love for you to, to, to tackle the regenerative business question. Okay, I'll, do, I'll go the reverse order and make the carbon sequestration quick. So basically, all the science is pointing, it's not done, we're not finished, there's more research to do, but there's enough done that we shouldn't stop and say, well, we just don't know yet, so we're not going to do any carbon sequestering forms of agriculture. No, head in that direction and we'll get the science done as we go. Um, there's still a lot to figure out. I think accounting for above ground sequestration as well as below ground sequestration is really key. Um, there's a lot of new technology that's going to come out soon that's going to really speed up the reading of soil carbon and you know automated ways with satellite technology. Uh, folks like Regen Network are doing some great work to, to just make it quicker to be following outcomes. We're not there yet, but it's the direction we should head. In terms of regenerative business, um, uh, we should definitely be heading in this direction. How good is a company is working to do it? Some of our major partners are working at a very deep level, but it has to go to the level of NIGYAR. It has to go to the executive committee. You need people there who are, who are taking the time to really get in and say, what does it mean to be a regenerative business? And that can never be a checklist. If you ever see anybody giving you a checklist of things that makes you a regenerative business, just you know, ignore them because it's there's no it doesn't work that way. Living systems are more complex than that. And if we're aiming to actually regenerate living systems, then there's never any set of boxes or single things that you can do to get there. It has to be a developmental learning journey for everyone in the whole company to move you towards regeneration over time. I, I don't think there's any companies that I would say are fully regenerative right now, but I also don't think that's a bad thing. I think we want to be on this journey and we can always go farther. Um, regenerative agriculture is a great thing to do alongside because when you get people on a farm, when you visit Leah's farm, when you visit these places and you experience a whole eco-social, cultural, spiritual, culinary system, it very, very quickly helps you to move in your mind towards the way you need to think in order to do regenerative business. So yeah, we should do it. And it's not quick. Don't think you're going to get there tomorrow, but uh, let's go. Brilliant answer. We have limited time left. And I want to make sure that I bring up the slide with where you can bring, get actually get the Food Barometer Report on. But in the Food Barometer Report, we look at in the social listening. So the social listening, um, we don't break it down by gender. We don't break it down by region because we don't know where people are, who, who, who the people are who are sharing this information. It's, a, it's an honest mirror up to what people are talking about um, online. And in that social listening, we look at the past where people were talking uh, before the pandemic. We look at the pivot, this huge, huge conversation change that's happening across these 14 different aspects, much of which is reflected by the conversation we've had today. But we also look at the possible. Um, what should we be hoping for? What should we be working for? What should we be farming for? What should we be fighting for? So I'd love to ask um, each of uh, the panelists what their greatest hope is for where the food revolution goes next. So, so where, where are we going with, with food? It is such an intimate, cultural, unique, special, and yet completely universal experience for everybody um, uh, that connection with food it is it is part of part of what it is to be life um so so this is this is this is not a transition like the energy transition that we're going to make from one form of energy to another form of energy it's much more complex than that um it's not a switch on switch off so and part part of it this is me making space for my panelists to think of their wonderful answer which is where do you think we're going to go next with food so i'm going to go in a different um uh order than i started with i'm going to come to ethan first what's your hope for the possible oh there's so much possibility and potential coming up, but I think a lot of it has to do uh, with the, it's really the last question that was asked and with the companies at the scale of Danone, uh, taking the big steps, not just to think about regenerative agriculture, but to think how does the whole concept of regeneration actually inform our business strategy? And what we found over the last 40 years of, of businesses that have stepped towards regeneration is that they actually see significant growth in financial capital profits as well, while becoming more responsible and more resilient to shocks to the system that we are most likely going to have again. So um, I think the future of food is very delicious. 
I think it's very diverse and tied to the culinary and geographic place. And I think it will see more partnering between those extreme ends of the spectrum uh, from the small scale regenerative farmers led by the people of the global majority uh, connecting to the scale and economies and what has been learned uh, by big CPG. I think seeing that connectivity, there's, there's some pitfalls, but there's also a huge amount of potential there. Brilliant, that's a great answer, Ethan. We go, where next? For big companies like Denon, which have such an impact upon all of us and are responding to these huge trends. What is possible for you, do you think? So for us, the possibility of the food revolution is exactly formulated as one planet, one health, is having the food which is not making people to choose between their health and the health of the planet. But if I was to think about one word which I would like to bring uh, to this conversation and um, possibility, that word would be justice. And it's justice to everyone who is involved. It's also justice in ability to satisfy the fundamental human right to have an access to healthy, safe food and water. And there are so many people in the world which are deprived of this. And we can't ignore that while we are talking about the regenerative agriculture and while we are talking about the Nutri-Score, there are millions and billions of people and children, most importantly, which are starving, which do not have access to the food which enables them to grow healthy and to become an active members of our society. And uh, for me, this bringing justice and making food accessible, good food accessible, good hydration and safe water accessible. This is what we as a company are standing for and the driving. And to me, that would be the most important dimension of the future of the food revolution. Yeah, thank you. After years of working then on, you still managed to surprise me because I've been calling for the word justice to enter the big business lexicon for a while now and I haven't heard it so thank you so much for bringing that word in because it's not a common word heard by big business although I think businesses such as Leah's and others are very familiar with it it's a terminology every big company is going to going to need to tackle if we're going to collectively tackle our challenges. So yeah, I'll give you the last word in terms of what the possible is, because I think from what we've heard from you, thank you so much for the resources that you share. In many ways, what you're doing is the living embodiment of the possible. So what do you see next? Um, or what do you hope is going to be possible for all of us next in our relationship with food? Hmm. Thank you for that. We do try to be the change we wish to see. And uh, my daughter, Nishima, uh, when she was just a tot, you know, now she's 18, said the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto your plate. And what I love about that beautiful imagery is it invites us to think about all of these steps along the way of absorbing this sunlight from the land to the workers, um, to processors and distributors, to consumers. And as mentioned in the opening remarks, we have quite a bit of injustice in each of those arenas. We have wild maldistribution of land and land dispossession, theft, genocide related to land holdings. We have the exploitation of farm workers globally. Uh, we have uh, really devastating land loss, um, especially amongst black farmers in the United States because of federal discrimination. Uh, we, we have, as mentioned, disproportionate hunger uh, and, and borders, border, burdens of, of food-related illness um, like diabetes and kidney failure. And so my vision, my, my aspiration for the food system is that we do infuse justice at every single point along the way from sunshine to plate. We redistribute the land and share it fairly. We make farm work, not just a livable, but a dignified uh, career that easily moves into ownership and leadership. Um, we make sure that everybody has enough to eat of their culturally appropriate foods. Um, and we do all of this in a way that honors the earth as kin and not as a resource to be used up and exploited. Um, that's my hope for justice along that arc. Uh, Leah, thank you so much. As someone who grew up in a farming community and ran away, from it um, fast as a, as a girl, as so many people do, you give me hope that perhaps uh, farming is, is, is a place of beauty and hope and justice um, if we choose to make it so. So thank you so much for that. Thank you everybody for joining. As promised right at the beginning, here is the link 
where you can go and um, download the Food Revolution Barometer with all of that depth of research, all of that insight right up to the, up to the minute, years worth of, um, of data and analysis. I hope you use it. I hope it makes sense. <laughs> Um, it has been an absolute privilege to watch this debate um, change over the past years and to have the chance of thinking about what might be possible next. And I want to give a massive thanks to Nigar, to Leia and to Ethan for joining on this great debate. This was even better than I could have hoped. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions. They started coming through thick and fast at the end, but we will review them. Um, and of course, we'll be making the, uh, the tape of this conversation available to everybody um, because I think quite a lot of folks might want to share it. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your days, your, your evenings, your mornings, wherever you are around the, food, around the world. And as always, after a debate like this, I'm going to go and have something to eat. So thank you so, so, so very much. And please do enjoy your day. Thanks, everyone.